There are so many different ways that anime can draw us in. Pulse pounding, nah, too wordy. So, Oshinoko, it's an anime with an opening, and you don't need me to tell you that opening's pretty great. It was the number one song in the world outside America. I'm sure you've heard it in a lot of TikToks. And today, we're here to analyze a bit of the song itself, but mostly the animation that goes with it in the opening credits, which is full of symbolism and cinematic storytelling that conveys way more about the show than you might have realized. Not nearly as much as the Chainsaw Man OP, as you can probably tell from the timestamp, but that's why I have this second channel, so I can do these sort of short, fun analytical videos again without risking the algorithm's wrath against the bigger stuff on Mother's Basement, where, funny coincidence, I just today also posted a big honkin' look back at the whole first season of Oshinoko. And I'd really like to keep this analysis nice and light to give you time to go check that out when we're done, so let's dive right in. As the OP begins, we slowly zoom in on the TV slash I Hoshino shrine in Sarina's dark, recently vacated hospital room with five of our principal performer's eyes fading into superimposed view and turning to the camera one after another. An optimistic interpretation of this scene is this is a night when Sarina is sneaking around the hospital or practicing her dancing, whereas a pessimistic, let's be honest, realistic reading, is that this is the night she died. Four of the five characters who appear here had their lives touched in some way or another by Ai in the past. Aqua and Ruby, most obviously as her children, but Kana's appearance on set with Ai, and more importantly Aqua, changed the whole trajectory of her life. And Akane becomes tied up in Aqua's life by studying Ai to imitate her on the dating show. Memcho is the only one who doesn't have any confirmed link to her so far, but given that she's secretly 25 and has aspired to be an idol since she was a young girl, the timing does line up for I to have been her inspiration as well. And it would be quite appropriate if all of these characters did look to I for guidance and inspiration in one way or another, because of course it's I herself who suddenly appears on the television they're all looking toward, which seems to switch on by itself in the empty room. Spooky. As is the way she fades into static at the end of the shot transition. She's animated very smoothly here, singing and bobbing her head along to the lyrics of Idol, which makes sense as Yoasabi wrote it as her character song, but there's something else that's interesting about how Eyes animated here, or rather, how she's framed. Unlike every other character in the OP so far, we can't see Eyes' eyes, and we won't for quite some time until a key emotional beat later on. Eyes are, of course, the windows of the soul. They can tell us so much about a person with a single glance. And indeed, they do exactly that in this sequence. Aqua, Ruby, Kana, Memcho, and Akane all convey a little bit about their personalities just by how they look at the camera. And by hiding eyes' eyes from us, the OP thus implies some sense of mystery around who she really is, which is, of course, one of the main driving factors behind Aqua's obsession with the mystery of her murder, the feeling that he and Ruby never really knew their mother. But let's put a pin in that for a second. The next few shots give us a clearer picture of the twins' characters. First up, Aqua appears as a tiny figure in front of this huge stadium screen projecting an image of his chest, the crop hiding his eyes from the audience. The camera then pulls in close, giving us, but not whoever's in front of that stage, a look at his expression as he closes those eyes and turns away from the spotlight. The shots that follow that highlight the contrast between him and his twin. Ruby is first shown looking away from the camera, the screen behind her framing her torso at a similar distance to Aqua's. But then, in the more intimate close-up, she turns to face us with a sly grin, holding a finger to her lips as if to say, the secret of my mom's between you and me, anime viewers. Then, the camera pulls back out wide to show us the face that she shows her in-universe audience, giving the classic tongue-out anime girl wink smile, projected quite clearly and cropped so that we can actually see it on the jumbotron behind her. This expression is one of the most iconic in Japanese pop culture, originating with Fujiya Ginza's candy mascot, Peko-chan. It embodies a very sweet, childish energy, saying, yeah, I'm adorable and I know it. Or, with the added context of a head tap, it says, 
Yeah, I know I should be embarrassed, but I also think I'm cute enough to get away with it. The next brief shot again reinforces the dichotomy between the twins, with blue and pink lights refracted from a marble splitting apart to show their paths in life diverging. This is then followed by an image of five crows flying across the Tokyo sky, an auspicious symbol of divine guidance in Japanese culture. This could be taken as a metaphor for how I has inspired all of these young performers, but given the supernatural elements already at play in the anime, it could also be taken more literally as a hint at divine intervention in the story. The final shot in this symbolic sequence of an empty Google search bar speaks to the show's underlying theme of mystery in a very modern, digital age sort of way. Also, I really enjoy how the I'm feeling lucky button's been replaced with I'm feeling good, which feels like a very ironic thing for this show to say. Though, I guess it does kind of fit a transition to Memcho, who's easily the peppiest member of this cast. She does a cute little dance for the camera, presumably to be posted on TikTok, ending with a cheerful grin that's followed by a slightly more mischievous grin, this time in profile. This mostly feels like just an influencer doing influencer stuff, but that does fit her character, and the animation certainly matches the energy of the music. Director Daisuke Hirameki then lets his, let's be honest, very relatable Kana Arima bias show here by making her character intro more than twice as long and way more detailed. We start with a snap tilt wide shot, fading to a close up of Kana sitting with a bemused smile in the leaky warehouse set of Sweet Today. This plays over the lyrics, there's none, none, none of this and none, none, none of that, which references the idol industry taboo against idols dating and you know, doing other stuff. Which is appropriate to the scene, considering the scene they shoot here is a confrontation with the heroine Stalker, where Aqua delivers a performance based on the idol Stalker who killed I for breaking that taboo. The next lines, what's your type? Who are you dating? Come on, answer. Follow up on that idea by echoing the incessant questions that idols need to face in the press. And over those lines, we see shots of Kana stalking Aqua in the school hallway, then zooming in on him with her fingers, which seems to foreshadow the shot from the finale where she focuses in on her crush in the middle of B. Komachi's debut performance at Idolfest. Now, we don't actually clearly see Aqua in that second shot, but the idea that she's focusing on him is reinforced by the cut to Akane, who, of course, becomes his work girlfriend over the course of the season, and also, as we learn in the season one finale, has some beef with Kana, dating back to when they were both child actors. Though this particular sequence doesn't directly reference that. Instead, like the last two girls, the shot mainly tells us what Akane's career is by placing her on a stage. While the rain falling around her as she stands barefoot and the lights blinking out in the wide shot foreshadow the night that she tries to take her own life. We learn all that in the space of two seconds. That is some mighty efficient visual storytelling. As the song shifts into its pre-chorus, the OP shifts focus to Aqua, starting in his past life as Dr. Goro. He stands as a frail outline in this vast darkness, lab coat blowing in the wind as a few shaking red glow sticks emerge from the shadows like the eyes of hungry predators. This symbolizes his first second-hand glimpse of what it's like to stand in the spotlight as he works to deliver eyes babies. Also, the fact that he's about to be killed by a rabid fan. The OP then captures that moment symbolically in the heavily stylized shot of his old glasses being shattered as he falls off the cliff. But there's also a double meaning in that those glasses are literally rose-tinted, or at least the background behind them is, alluding to the disillusionment with the entertainment world that grows within him during his life as Aqua, who's then shown as a teenager silhouetted against what's now a sea of pen lights thrusting in time with the oi, oi, oi of the backup singers. After that, my interpretation of that rose coloring is reinforced by a shot of a single rose withering under a bright blue flame, which if you're even slightly familiar with Japanese folklore, you'll instantly recognize as a hitodama, the lingering soul of the dead. Taking all of that imagery together, it's easy to interpret this shot as a symbol of the moment that I was killed with a knife hidden in a bouquet. That tragic fate is evoked once again as the spotlights flare up and I takes the stage to sing the chorus. The moment the lights behind her switch 
from pink to white, the lasers in front also form an X right over the spot where she's going to be stabbed. Also note that we still haven't been shown Eyes Eyes, and it's finally time to get into why. The lyrics of the pre-chorus that plays over these last few shots about not understanding love or being able to tell truth from lies, of course describe Eyes' own inner turmoil, but they also get to the root of Aqua's obsession, the feeling that he never truly understood his idol, his mother, right up to the bitter end. Speaking of bitter, the three-shot montage leading into the chorus proper highlights our hero's feelings of isolation and loss directly. The cold, dark day of Ai's funeral in her empty apartment. The Ai's eternal fan badge that he kept tucked away in his lanyard as a doctor. And, of course, Serena flashing a weak smile with her eyes closed right before fading away forever. These are the images that flash before Aqua's eyes before he scrambles through the darkness behind the scenes, frantically searching for the truth about Ai, which is intercut by way of waving pink pen light wipe transitions, with I herself dancing to the chorus on stage as the camera whirls dramatically around her. The first two shots tease both us and Aqua by hanging behind I, refusing to show us her face. And then, when she finally does spin our way to give us that glimpse into her soul, it's ripped away from Aqua's grasp as quickly as it appeared, the image shattering as he desperately lunges toward it. After that, his tormented image fades as well, though the shattered glass stays hanging in the air as we transition to Ruby's perspective on their mother and her passing. While the lyrics describe I as a perfect, ultimate idol never to appear again, the incarnation of the morning star, Ichiban Boshi if you know your Japanese, Venus if you know your astrology, Ruby's character shot directly contradicts that notion. In contrast to her frantic twin, she waits patiently beneath the sprawling heavens as the shining remnant of Ai's star slowly descends. Then she gently clasps it when it finally does reach her to carry on their mother's legacy. This is then followed by another quick three-shot montage, this time highlighting some of Ruby and Sarina's fondest memories. First, there's Ai as Sarina used to see her, a vision of pure light in the blurry and distant world beyond the hospital. Then we cut to Ruby's favorite plushie, a gift from Ai that happens to resemble Ai's own hairpin thing, what with the ribbon around its neck, but at the same time, the flower on its head and the turtleneck that ribbon is wrapped around kind of make it look like Sarina herself, which adds a slightly melancholy note as it slumps limply to the side. But we don't linger there. Instead, we jump to I, Ruby, and Aqua, enjoying a moment of domestic bliss together, probably watching I do something cool on YouTube. This sequence frames the bubbly and optimistic Ruby in obvious contrast to her darker, more twisted brother, as well as the other girls we're about to see in the rest of the OP. Though, given how both the lyrics of the chorus here and most of the images in the next sequence focus on lies about love and lies that are love, you could also read those happy memories as Ruby lying to herself. There's a lot of layers to unpack there, but let's move on to the other girls. First, Kana's opportunities dry up and her parents head for the countryside, leaving her to bite her lip and put on a brave face in the sunset of her child acting career, which might also be the dawn of her career as an idol. Then we see Akane, hiding the agony that she's feeling from all the on online harassment under the covers where her mom won't have to worry about it. This then fades into a shot of the thing that ultimately helped her bounce back from that. The Hoshino Ai, let's call it a conspiracy cork board, that she put together to nail that role for Aqua on Love Now, which is then match cut with the results of Aqua's own obsessive investigation into Ai 45510, the code that finally unlocked her old smartphone after four years of brute force. But then, that's match cut again with another way that Aqua aimed to preserve Ai's memory by disguising himself as Pieon to help the new B Komachi be the best Komachi they could be, which also happens to be a lie he tells out of his love for Kana. The next two shots focus on Miyako and Gotanda, who are essentially Ruby and Aqua's surrogate parental figures, or, as some might put it, 
their fake parents, yet the love they feel for their kids as they take breaks from work and stare off into the distance dramatically thinking about them is clearly very real, as was Ichigo Saito's fatherly love for Ai, hence why the producer abandoned his career and ran off to drown his sorrows in lake fishing after she died, as the next shot shows us. Then the final frames of the montage poetically note Ai's own absence from this world by hanging on the Tokyo skyline at night. The lights there too bright for any stars to be seen above. Those missing stars are suggested in the next shot, though, by the lights hanging above B. Komachi as they stride out onto stage for their debut at Idol Fest at the end of the season. Now, when we see this shot in the actual anime, there are curtains in front of the stage, which does make it seem like it might be a different moment, but the sound equipment on either side of them is identical. Our final beautifully animated shot of Ruby shows bright light washing across her face as she steps out onto the stage, which mainly serves to contrast the final equally gorgeous shot of Aqua, in which his face falls into shadow as he spins around dramatically in front of a whirling Tokyo skyline. Here, once more, the OP is highlighting how the twins' paths in life are diverging. And with how similar that zoom in on Aqua's eye is to the shot of eye from the middle of the OP, right before she shattered, it further suggests that the path of revenge he's on might just lead to his own ruin. A dark thought to go out on as we transition to the title card, whose shifting color palette again evokes this theme of contrast between the darker and lighter sides of this story. As that title card hangs before us, the fans singing in the background chant, you're my savior, my true savior, my saving grace, speaking to the frightening fanaticism of their faith in Ai's lies. Then, in one last neat little touch, we transition into the final production credits with a CRT signal glitch that mirrors Ai's first appearance at the start of the opening. All told, this opening is a brilliantly composed and condensed example of visual storytelling, where every shot has a clear purpose and every sequence is united by a clear central theme, as is the full-length animated music video for this song, come to think of it. But me and my editors have our hands full enough with this analysis and the review over on the main channel, which you ought to go watch if you haven't already, so yeah, no music video today. Maybe we can pick it apart together in a live stream or some point, though then I'd really be opening myself up to spoilers, because... Full disclosure, I haven't actually read ahead in the manga yet. This analysis was solely based on watching the first season and reading the first volume, meaning I almost certainly missed some key bits of foreshadowing or character details that are only revealed later on. I wouldn't be surprised if there was more to that shot of Memcho, for instance. Now that we're waiting on season two, though, I probably am going to crack and start reading ahead before too long. And hey! If you want to read ahead with me, or just see how the anime differs from its source material, they just so happen to have that manga over on Bookwalker, Kadokawa's extremely high quality official ebook service. And I just so happen to have a Bookwalker discount code, basement, that'll give any new user 500 yen off any book on the store, so do with that information what you will. Peace out, bitches. Nah. Too rude.